Um, welcome. Thank you for uh, attending. Um, you've already, I think most of you in the class were attending the lectures up to now um, that were meant as a kind of introduction into the, um, I think the network information theory was, was, con was supposed to be sort of a main uh, part in the sense that you also have courses on information theory here, as far as I understand. There are some people in the audience who have been involved in those courses. Um, I uh, probably, you know, this, the notes were here handed out. Um, I, I got interested actually in this topic, well I got interested during my PhD already in network information theory, but there was no course or anything like that at ETH in Zurich. Uh, Jim Massey was also interested in network information theory, but more, mainly in multiple access problems, random accessing, and he was always, you know, sort of a mixed practical engineer as well as someone who liked the math theory, but never for math for its own sake, but, you know, as a tool to help understand engineering problems. So he was very much into cryptography at that time, did a lot of algebraic coding and so forth. Uh, so I kind of got interested in this on my own and I had to, I, you know, I studied the Cover Thomas book, the papers and so on. And then around 2004, I taught a course like this one. I gave five lectures at ETH Zurich with Amos Lapidot, who I think uh, wanted to <laughs> have half the semester off. That's why he is getting someone to help teach. And then I started writing those notes. That's how I got into this topic. And it's developed a little bit since then. Um, so the topics that I want to talk about are uh, mainly from the booklet. I was going to give an introduction to network information theory now. I'll do that in a certain sense, a little bit of a light introduction. And then we'll get into um, some uh, the, the distributed source coding problem and move on to uh, mobile radio problems like broadcast channels and multiple access channels and so on. But the first thing I want to do is relate uh, classic networking problems to um, information theoretic models. I think this is something, it's, it's something that surprised me the first time I saw it. So let's just talk about, begin with, you know, introduction to network information theory. Not information technology, but information theory. Um, so let me begin with a network. So if you think of usually what we talk about with networking, when you think of a network, we usually draw a graph, right? So the graph, if we think of the graph, it's really a pair of vertices and edges. So for example, if we have a four node network, we might have four nodes, one, two, three, four, right? And then usually, so those are the vertices, a set of vertices is one, two, three, four. Then you have a set of edges, one, two, two, four, one, three, three, four, maybe also one, four. And then usually, so here I've drawn them as directed edges. Sometimes you talk about undirected edges too, but let me focus on directed edges here. Um, and often we give, we label the edges with some capacities. For instance, C1, 2, C2, 4, uh, C1, 4, C1, 3, and C3, 4, right? So we talk about stuff like that. And one of the basic uh, problems that um, came up, so th this kind of the study of networking um, goes back into the, of course, actually I don't know how far back it goes on to, but in terms of looking at capacities and so on, there was a great interest in this in the early 20th century when you had railway networks and you wanted to start understanding, now we get a little bit morbid, you know, which, rail lines should we bomb or destroy to prevent the movement of troops from, you know, to the front, from the back, right? Uh, w which are the most important links to cut? And um, so you can go back into the, there, there's uh, books, of course, many books on this topic on combinatorial optimization problems that start with graphs. Uh, the one aspect I'd like to look at is thinking about a capacity of graphs. So suppose we have a source. So usually, you know, in addition to a graph like that, when we talk about communications, are also transmitting things. Like if you think of this as a railway network, you know, this this rail this rail line might have a capacity of so and so many C one two units per day, C two four units per day, and so on. 
and often we talk about a source node. So suppose this was the source node, and often in the basic uh, networking literature, you talk about source node S, you talk about a sync node T, so you have an ST pair, ST pair, and you're asked the question, well, how many units of some commodity, a car, a apple, how many apples, how many oranges, you know, how many liters of um, gasoline and so forth can we transmit from here to here? What's the rate that we can transmit over this network? Now, this, this particular one is actually quite simple, uh, but, le but let me talk now about um, this notion of a cut. So a cut is one way to get a bound on um, the rate of sending uh, material. So a cut, it, what, what a cut is, it's a, what you do is you, you take the vertices and you split them into two sets. So you partition the vertices into two sets. V into a pair, S, S, C, S complement. So S complement is the complement of the set S in the vertex set. And then we talk about the value of the cut, which is just then just the um, sum of the capacities of the node, uh, 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 capacities of those edges going from one set S to the other set S. So for example, if we think of these nodes here, um, S, T2, T3, uh, uh, S, uh, node 1, node 2, node 3, node 4. Um, uh, there are, of course, you know, many cuts to look at because there are many ways we can partition these sets. The one I'm going to be interested in is when the source node is an S and the sync node is in T. And then there are four cuts, right? There's going to be this one, this one, this one, and this one, right? So the subsets are 1 by itself or 1 and 2 or 1 and 3, or 1, 2, and 3, right? So if I want to have the sink here and the source here. So in any case, the value of the cut more generally is we go over all nodes B and S, and over all nodes B and S, C, and we add up the capacities, right? That's the value of the cut. So if we talk about now rates, Right, so I've already drawn that. Suppose there is um, one source at node S and uh, one sink at node T. So for our case, S is one, T is four. Um, then the maximum rate then the rate, maximum rate of sending commodities. Later, this commodities will be to us bits, right? Right now, we're talking about uh, uh, physical commodities. So I'll talk about like that, commodities. Is um, uh, at most, so I should say the rate of sending that as most the value of any cut or any cut s s c where s is an s where the source is an s and the sink is an s c right so you all know that so for this particular example so here of course we're going to get r less than or equal to well we have the four cuts one is this one, so it's going to be less than min C12 plus C13 plus C14. That's this cut. This cut here is the others, C13 plus C14 plus C24. Then we have uh, this one, now we have this cut, C12 plus, oh, uh, yeah, C14 plus C24. And then the final cut is this one, C14 plus C24 plus C34. Right, so you've all seen that before. Um, uh, what's remarkable about this bound, though, is that it turns out to be tight, right? So for uh, so the, uh, proving this is kind of intuitive, and it's not very hard 
in fact, to show. What is more interesting is that you can actually achieve this, right? So this turns out, so it turns out can achieve, we can achieve equality here. Um, by a smart uh, assignment of commodities to links, right, of commodities to links. And in fact, there's a simple algorithm or relatively simple algorithm to determine what this assignment is. And this is, so that you probably know this is due to Ford and Fulkerson who published a paper in the Canadian Mathematical Journal in 1956 on this topic. I think one of them was working at Waterloo University in Canada, I think. Not sure where, but they were, they were actually also involved in consulting for, I think, some U.S. military thing. I mean, at that time, right, everything was nationalized, including Bell Labs, for example, and also a lot of these uh, basic results came out of these big national labs. So it wasn't really military directly, it was more under the funding as far as I know anyway. What you may not know is that Shannon also published a paper. <laughs> I think it was actually the same year, also proving this result. Now his re paper was a few months afterwards. So usually, and, and also because they were really in that community and, and they popularized that method, um, was it Chen or was it Elias now? Actually, I think it was both. It may have been both. I'm not sure now. But, I, I, but Shannon for sure was one who was involved in publishing it. It may have been co-authored. I'm not sure now. But it, it's, it's interesting just historically. They independently came up with this result at the same time. Okay. Now, there's a few remarkable things about this. Um, first of all, well, I should, be, I should be a little bit careful in, you know, we should be a little bit careful how we you know, say this, there's a few things to be said about that. The first thing is when you look at how you achieve it, um, one interesting thing is, well, you know, if these capacities here, if, if you're thinking of a commodity like an apple or an orange or a pear, you don't want to slice the apple in half and then send half an apple one way and half the apple the other way because putting it together <laughs> later probably won't work, right? Um, so often one talks about integer capacity constraints. And it turns out if capacities are integer constraints, you can actually then also achieve, of course, all of these will be integers then too. And it turns out you can uh, achieve this upper bound without splitting anything. Uh, what's also interesting, if we think about communications, it turns out, you know, um, if we're at a node like this, um, it's very easy to copy for us, like, you know, you can just take a photocopy of a page and send the same thing here and here. So you can copy two bits, but it's copying things like commodities usually isn't very easy to do. You can't take an apple and suddenly copy it, right, and create two apples. So what I'm emphasizing by that is all this entire theory was developed for physical commodities for which you can't do certain things, which you can do with communications because when we have bits, well, we can do things like copying, or we can also split if we have a set of bits. So if we have, if our commodity is a packet, it's usually not too hard to split the packet in half and then put it together at the end. It doesn't really destroy the quality, which of course would happen with an apple and an orange, right? So you, there you don't want to do it. So I want to talk about some generalizations of this. So everything here was developed for physical commodities, and a lot of the theory that was done in the networking area was based on this idea that we're looking at commodities and bounds you get and uh, algorithms you develop. When we go to communications, because we can do more, we want to permit more things. And that will also lead to uh, a more interesting, um, I think, a more interesting mathematics. It's not just going to be um, a lot of this involves linear programming, right? So sophisticated linear programming results. Whereas once you uh, work with bits, you can do more, you can add codes, you can actually do coding. So I just emphasize that it's not as if there wasn't a reason why they didn't invent this earlier. It's because they weren't looking at communication. So communication started becoming important, of course, um, um, already in the 1800s, but and also communication networks. 
these networks were usually looked at as commodities, though, usually. OK, so we want to talk about some generalizations of this. So what kind of generalizations do we have? To com like to the classic perspective? Well, one is, of course, uh, we can allow splitting so if, uh, for communications. So and when I talk about communications, usually I mean talking about transmitting bits or packets. So we can uh, allow um, uh, messages to be split and copied. So this is sometimes called fractional. Uh, so this method here, uh, Ward Fulkerson, both methods used routing right, to achieve their results. So rather than routing, we can allow messages to be split and uh, copied. Right. So copying is allowed. Allow message just to be copied. Okay, those are important extensions which turn out not to be needed for this problem, right? So for just a single source, single sync pair, we don't need this. It might still be interesting to consider using it. In fact, well, I should be careful to say we don't need it. We do need it if these capacities are fractions in some sense. But usually if this was a fraction, so for instance, if this was a rational number, say uh, 5 over 11 and the least uh, common multiple of all the denominators is some number. We can just multiply by that and get an integer, right? So we can get back to just sending commodities again. But anyway, the, my, the important thing is I want to say these might be helpful if there was more general problem to look at. But where, where allowing messages to be split or copied becomes important um, is when we talk about multiple sources and sinks. And that's what we do want to look at. Of course, there's a lot of, you can write out a linear programming problem for multiple sources and things, but where it gets really interesting is we can allow network coding. Now, what does network coding refer to? It refers to um, basically um, combining messages at so this, uh, this network isn't such a great example. The, let's suppose we have a node that has multiple incoming links and multiple outgoing links. We can take a message here, let's say message one and message two, and here send some constant times message one plus some constant times message two. Here, some constant times message one plus B times constant message two, right? And that's what's called network coding is when you do in node um, combining of messages. Okay, so these are all extensions of the basic networking model, and all these extensions are interesting, uh, both mathematically and from an engineering perspective, and also for applications. Um, I'll give you one example in a moment, uh, something that has been developed um, in the context of satellite communications in Munich. Okay, well actually that was going to be my next example, so here we go. Let's do an example. So here's the simplest example I think where network coding plays a role. It's not going to be the butterfly network, but it's going to be effectively the same kind of idea. But the idea is to think of following, suppose we have three nodes, you know, two nodes here, they're down on the ground. Here we have a satellite up in the air, right? You might have a link that goes up, link that goes up, capacity, let's just say here it's one and one, and then the, the base station can transmit something down, some signal down. Usually those beams are very broad, right? So you have cover a lot of ground, and suppose the capacity here is one. Then it turns out that if we have two sources in sync, so let's see here source one and sync one, and source two and sync two, and we give this guy here a rate one, and we give this guy here a rate two, then you can communicate at R1 equals R2 equals one, right? If this here was in bits per second, 
all these numbers are in bits per second, the capacities. And how do we do that? Well, every second we put in one bit here, right? V1. Every second we put one bit here, and here we just send V1, X, or V2. Right, very simple, right? This is the simplest example of network coding. That example, where, which is most practical, I think. The butterfly network is, is, is nice, but I think it's a little bit complicated. It's not nearly as practical. <laughs> I mean, it, this is the same idea. If you think of the butterfly network, those of you who know it, it also has like a common uh, bottleneck. But this is really simple. And in fact, this is even practical. So um, in, in Munich, so Raymond Young, who was one of the originators of this idea in terms of multicasting in networks, the idea actually existed before. Even his work in um, um, routing networks. So there were some early papers from the early 90s that actually do this for some simple uh, routing networks, but it wasn't extended to the general case. Um, anyway, he was visiting Munich, talked with Christoph Günther, who's a manager at German Aerospace. They had a project which was run from about 2009 to 2014, uh, showed how this works. Actually, once you start implementing this, <laughs> Of course, you run into a lot of other challenges because usually the information that's coming into nodes in a practical system is bursty. And since it's bursty, you know, sometimes up here you might only have bits from one node and not one from the other, and then you're not getting this gain in rate. So you have to start adding buffering. And how you, how you do the buffering and the queuing of the packets to um, obey the uh, delay constraints, and then how you do the coding, and I'll come back to that next generalization in a moment. Of course, these channels are noisy, right? They're not noise free like here. So putting all the whole system together is really interesting. But the fundamental new idea is just to put this into practice, the simple idea, right? And then once you start trying to build it, you have this whole big <laughs> project you have to start doing. It was it was quite successful. Um, so they showed doing this, they, the biggest gain was actually a power gain due to channel coding, because you can do channel coding at a, a lower rate using this method than before, and that gave you, a, uh, that, that was the biggest gain, was actually the power gain. Why is that important? Because the satellite has to be very power efficient, right? It's a satellite, it's out in space. The only energy it's getting is from the sun, um, and it takes quite a lot of energy to send stuff down. So, okay, the power gain was, is really important. It was a substantial power gain. Like so, that was at least on the order of 3 dB or so, something like this. So, so you're, you're extending even then the lifetime for the same rate of the satellite, or alternatively, you can send at a 50% higher rate, it turns out, for this problem. Okay, a lot of interesting things come out, out of these simple ideas, right? And that's why we're interested in the math, because it gives us these really simple new insights that then can grow into a big project and can make a lot of money long term, right? I mean, it really, it's really important. It's not just, it's not just math. <laughs> it's real. It really makes a difference. Um, this is planned for a satellite launch, uh, maybe this year or next year. So it's, it's on onboard experiment on one of the uh, satellites going up. I have to check what the status is, but there's a lot of work that goes into, even once you build an FPGA to demonstrate this, then putting it onto a satellite, <laughs> And then launching it takes a lot of work because you, a lot of things have to get approved, right? And there's so many checks you have to do. It takes years, several years, to put up something like this. And it's fascinating once you start seeing this thing. So, any case, that's a simple example of where coding is useful. Now we're coding. And I think also in real, like in wireless networks, this is the first thing that you're going to do. You know, exactly this, exactly this. And everything else is pretty hard. <laughs> this, is, this is easy to do. This is the one example you see almost everywhere. OK, um, let's do a few more generalizations. Um, the next thing, of course, and this is one of the first topic we'll look at in the next hour, is that we can also permit more general source models now. So for example, in this problem here, we're assuming these two sources are statistically independent, which makes sense for a lot of problems. But if you're thinking of um, some networks, like suppose this was a smaller network than a satellite, maybe just in this room, uh, there might be, I don't know, a microphone up there, a microphone up there. They're measuring the same signal, but a little one is louder, one is 
less loud, you have the fan going, it's, one has different statistics where there's no fan. And so, but the, what the source symbols you're measuring in both locations are of course correlated, right? It's not independent information, so how do we deal with that problem? So we can talk about allowing joint distributions of sources. So there's a source model of sources. So the source modeling becomes interesting. And of course, once we have something like that, we can allow distortions too. So in the last lecture yesterday, you learned about rate distortion theory. Uh, we can also allow distortions or, or, or trying to send information that is correlated to subject to some distortion constraints. And we talked a lot yesterday also about semantics. That's where the semantics goes in. What is the right distortion function to choose? Should it be mean squared error? That's not bad, right? We can do a lot of theory with it, but usually for a lot of realistic source models like speech or video, you know, the distortion function that you choose will depend a lot on many things. I mean, language, it will be uh, speech, it will be the language, it will be male, female, uh, it'll be have to do with the age of the person and so on. So all these things need to be adjusted. Same with videos, it will depend on whether it's a movie with a lot of panorama or it's a movie with a lot of fast action where you have to choose something different, right? Depending on what you're trying to achieve, right? So these two things are fascinating. This will remain with us probably for a long time because modeling sources and figuring out what the right semantics are is not easy, right? And, and people spent their entire careers doing this stuff. Like for speech modeling, um, that was very popular in Germany in the 50s, 60s. This, there was some famous professors in the Munich area. Uh, some of those people, their graduates later went to Erlangen in Nuremberg. MP3 came out of that group, right? And the development of MP3 in the 1980s was a really big deal because they patented it. It became a worldwide standard. Literally, they literally made billions over years and supported huge Fraunhofer institutes on that topic through that work. So dealing with semantics is very important, right? Can make a very big difference in the quality of your product if you're building something. Okay. Uh, next generalization will allow noise on links. Now, one way of allowing noise on links is to add channels here. So we learned about channel coding, right? So now we can just introduce a channel. For instance, I could introduce this channel. Rather than just modeling this link as being a rate-limited link of capacity C24, we'll model this as a channel PY4. We'll view this as an output and this as an input. Right? And we can view every link like that. And in fact, even the noise-free case is a special case of this model, where this is just a channel that is noise-free with rate C24. It's very easy to model, right? So we can allow noise on links. How does that change things? Well, it already brings up very interesting questions, some of which were only um, addressed relatively recently. So for example, if you have a large network like this, and individual links but with noise, what are the optimal coding strategies? Because there's two things we need to do if this was a noisy channel. One is we need to do a channel code over this, right, to get reliable communications. And then we can also introduce network coding. Should we separate the two? Should we combine the two? What's the right thing to do? And the answer today, I would say, is even not so clear, right? So there are some results that say that you can separate the two, which is true. However, the proof of this separation relies on doing, mimicking the network as if it was noisy. <laughs> so it's, they're not very practical algorithms that have been described this way. So it's, an, it's still an open problem, I think, of how to actually do this in a practical way. The codes that were used to prove this result are double exponential in growth size. So they, they don't really make any practical sense. But it's interesting to think about these things. So there's already a lot of open problems that we run into here. And finally, you know, and this is where we want to get at eventually. If you look at this model we have now, suppose these were all noisy links. Right? P 
y3 given yx1. In fact, let me even leave it like that. So this is a mixed network, right, with noise-free links, three of them, and two noisy links, for example. We can ask about what is the capacity of such a channel. However, you'll see all the links are separated. They're just all point-to-point -point channels. What if we want to take a more general perspective and change the network so that this is actually a big broadcast channel? Broadcast channel, we mean something like this. One input, three outputs. All right, so this might be one input, x1. Here we have one output, y2. Here's one output, y3. Here we'll talk, call it y4, although you know, it's just one link coming from in here. In fact, this model here generalizes the previous model because if this box in here just had three separate links, I would be back at the original situation. But the more general problem will have a broadcasting problem. And similarly, we could here add, for example, a multiple access channel of some kind. We could add everything we do. We can start extending, right? Here we have x2, um, x3. Three, maybe this link isn't here. So this is what we would call a broadcast channel, and this is what we would call a multiple access channel. I'll come to that terminology when I get there again. And of course, the more general version is we just have one big box with you know, four inputs and four outputs. Right? So this is here we're effectively now allowing interference. So we're always just generalizing, right? Extending these models, allow interference in transmission, whatever that means. What I mean by that is you just have some limitations on what you're doing at the input and receiving. Right? So these are just step by step extensions. And of course, every extension makes the problem more difficult. The original problem was hard enough. So now we're getting more and more difficult. You might ask, well, what's the whole point of this? Aren't we going getting so complicated that this whole thing is becoming ridiculous? In some sense, yes, right? On the other hand, you know, real life problems are like that. So we, you know, modeling, we want to bring in certain parts of these models. Usually the general problem is too difficult. So we have to look at special cases, right? And so we do a lot of that. This was one special case where everything was separated. In this course, we'll study a lot of, um, uh, other special cases. So let me just draw the final, more most general model, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. So we might have four nodes again. One, two, three, four. Now we just have one big box, which what, once we get there, we'll model as a, just a big conditional probability distribution. Lot, four Ys, four Xs. This guy has an input X1. So these are now usually real numbers or complex numbers, but more generally they could be anything. And we have four out channel outputs. And to make sure everything is defined consistently in a problem like this, we also have to build in some kind of, um, you know, consistency rules like causality in terms of coding, like, right? This node should be able to send the symbol only based on what it knows at a certain time, right? So you have to start building in some rules that make some sense. Okay, any questions about this? Okay, I mean, that's, that's what we're going towards or would like to. Uh, so for example, if we had a single so source sync pair, is you can ask, what's the capacity of this problem now? We will, would view these two nodes as being relays. We even have feedback permitted, right, in this example. What's the capacity of such a network? The answer is that we don't know. In fact, even if this was a channel with some very nice properties, we'll get to that Gaussian channels. Even then, we don't know what the final answer is. In fact, there are relatively large gaps between the best known achievable rates and the best known outer bounds. And there are research results coming out right now, which are really interesting, which improve on the results we have. And all these insights are, of course, very, will be very important in the future. There's, in my mind, no doubt about that. You know, the, because eventually we will come to devices that use these insights. 
we'll, we'll get there. I mean, we're at 5G now. It's, it's already set, standardized. So 6G will come in eight years. There'll be a 6G project. It probably will start like next year or the year after. Then there'll be a 7G and so on. I mean, this will continue. One of the reasons this, uh, you know, this continues um, is that, um, you know, the, the bandwidths grow. Right, so once you have a different bandwidth, you need a new standard. Once you have a new standard, you can build in new ideas. And usually then your processing power grows and so on, so you try to build in new methods. So what um, seems impossible today definitely seems possible tomorrow. I, I can give a little bit of an anecdote about this. When I was a PhD student in the mid-90s, I was on a, a project called Acts Frames, which was the precursor which defined this this research project group was the precursor to the group that defined the uh, wideband CDMA standard in the 1990s. And there was a young man who was clearly on a management track. He had finished his PhD recently, and he just said, "Ah, everything in wireless has been done." This was mid 90s. It's all been done. You know, there's that's why I don't want to work on research. I want to do management, right? Of course. Well, okay, you make a lot of money. I suppose that's the vision, the hope. <laughs> Doesn't always work out that way, of course. But, um, but that was an interesting experience for me um, because you know, as a young student, you think, well, maybe that person's right. It's, it's all over, right? Nothing to be done. And, and you know, MIMO just was coming out right at that time, and all the activity today on. Um, you know, 6G, 5G, 6G is going to be on massive MIMO, and all the developments we went through uh, since the mid 90s were all just starting then, right? And so, this is it's always dangerous um, to think that, you know, today everything's been done. Uh, I, I think that was an early lesson for me. Um, and I've learned that um, always again and again through um, the years. What I've also learned, and we can maybe say too, um, some I, I, progress in some sense has slowed, I think, in our understanding of the theory because it's getting harder and harder to make improvements. On the other hand, if you look at the corporate world in communications, um, there are still very big companies competing with each other. And all that means is that the small improvements become more important economically because they are com there's competition and every company needs to have an edge on the other company in order to be successful. So these small improvements become more important. At least that's been my experience in the last little while. It's again a reason not to be over pessimistic I think even about um, you know understanding of the theory because the small improvements are useful. Okay, anyway, that was end of non-technical part. Any uh, questions up to now? Yeah. Whatever we discussed in the checking some components. Yes, so, yes, we are. So in, in order, so everything we'll do in this course, and I'll, that's actually the next thing I want to briefly talk about, is we want to look at special cases. So we're not going to look at the most general case, because that's too, it's too difficult. And right now, we don't know enough even to get started, right? So. We want to get started with some simple examples, and we'll see how interesting those are already, right? Even the simplest examples are incredibly interesting, and there's many, many open problems already on those. Okay, so we'll be looking at very specific examples. Uh, what we want to look for is actually those examples that are hopefully very general, right? Something that gives us insight that um, has, you know, broad, gives us broad insight, and usually that's the simplest examples. Right. Everything else is too difficult to. Any other questions? Okay, so let's look at some um, toy examples. And these are, the, of course, the ones we will study um, in the next few days, where we don't have a lot of time. So much of what I will say will focus more on intuition. So let's, let me just look at some. We'll, I'll develop the math up to some point, but um, I'll try to point out where one needs to look a little bit more closely. So there's a classic, I'm calling these here one-hop examples. Um, you'll see why I say that. One is what you've already uh, looked at, so point-to-point uh, -point channels. So the most general model for a point-to-point -point channel 
is that's what Shannon studied in 1948, right? I mean, namely a channel. He he looked at memoryless channels, um, which isn't a great limitation for the theory. It really isn't any limitation on the theory, because if you have so he's looking at memoryless channels where every symbol here is a noisy function of that symbol there. In fact, if you look in Shannon's paper, you'll have this uh, other box here where he calls here noise. And effectively, his model is yi is some function of xi and these noise random variables. Right. So if you look in his paper, he had this functional approach to defining the channel. But he also used just the uh, conditional probability distribution model perspective that you usually learn in information theory. But I, I like to emphasize that both of these models are, this, are identical, right? So it's, sometimes it's useful to use this. So for example, when we look at Gaussian channels, that's what we always do. We always do this. We usually don't write out the Gaussian distribution anymore, right? We just say that's much simpler to understand. And for any channel like this, you can always find a function and a noise distribution that's statistically independent of the input um, for which you can write that relation for any py given x. That's why whenever I see a paper that says um, a channel with noise dependent noise that is dependent on the input, they're not choosing uh, the right noise in my perspective variable. The right noise variable will be the one that would be independent of the input because you can always do that. Uh, there's some reason. I mean, you can talk about that. It's a little bit of a fine point. But anyway, you can always write uh, any distribution. Like that. Okay. That's, so we've studied that. A lot of interesting theory here, right? Capacity learned is the maximum over all input distributions of mutual information between one input letter and one output letter. We can combine this now with the source statistics, and you can do a joint source channel coding problem, and then you discover that, it, well, if delay doesn't play a role, then you can separate source and channel coding. I'm not sure if you covered that already. So sh that's what Shannon really accomplished, right? Um, if you talk about finite block length, then the theory gets, you know, even more intricate. Um, so there's been a lot of activity on that recently, mainly in the random coding side. Um, it's been going on for decades on the real coding side. I mean, people have built real short block length codes for decades, right? So then it, one should be comparing random coding to the ultimate limits to the real code performance. Sometimes the real code performance beats the random coding bounds because <laughs> their codes are already much better, have improved a lot over the past few years. So it's important to keep that in mind. So a lot of interesting stuff there. Because this is the simplest model, it's had the most impact, right? You're gonna, your research will have the most impact the simpler the model is. <laughs> because, but it's hard to get, you know, fundamental new results there. But if you do get them there, that's really important. And it's really, really important. Um, Right, so we talk about source coding. Problem is a point-to-point -point problem where we have a source here and a wire here. So the broadcast channel, we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow. Right, I already showed it. That's a channel that with one input X and two outputs or more outputs Y1, Y2, usually we model it using a conditional probability distribution also. Um, we have the multiple access channel. It's the other direction. You know, the main applications that are usually looked at here are wireless channels. So this is a base station transmitting to two mobile users. And the multiple access channel is just the two mobile users transmitting back to the base station. A lot of activity on this problem nowadays, again, in the under the name NOMA, non-orthogonal multiple access, it's really old theory being re-looked at again, right? So it's base, it's the multiple access channel, all that work. But it's getting a lot of attention in the 5G um, and future. Soon they'll call it 6G, you'll see. Soon, soon it'll be called 6G. Uh, uh, then we'll also look at two hop problems. There's more one hop examples. We'll look at interference channels. The basic two-hop problem is the relay channel, something like this. Except here you could have three hops, but that's where you have three nodes, x1. And the relay channel has uh, three nodes, node 1, the relay, node 
the receiver. The receiver has the output Y3. The relay sees an output Y2 and sends X2, and here we'll have the channel Y3, Y2, because there's two channel outputs, one at the relay, one at the sink, and two channel inputs. All right, so we'll study capacity for this problem where there's one source here and one sink here. Okay, it's, the one, it's a two hop problem because in general, the best thing to do is you, you, you should wait here, right? You should give the relay a chance to help you. So you shouldn't decode after, you know, too few time units. Um, because of that, there's some extra delays due to the processing that happened here, which is interesting to think about practically. But you will see that this problem is enormously fascinating. It's, it's completely, uh, from a capacity perspective, I would say it's still completely open to solve the capacity region. And of course, there are sophisticated coding strategies. There, uh, there aren't many upper outer bounds, uh, but there's been really good progress on this problem recently. Okay, so it's very interesting, you know, current stuff that isn't even published yet, but has just been put on archive. Some very nice new fundamental information. Good. Um, that was what I wanted to say as an introduction. Okay, so because I still have a few minutes before the break, so what I'd like to do now is just get started on the next, on the first um, example that we want to look at in more detail. Uh, and what we'll be focusing on first is um, uh, source coding problems. Um, there's a reason for that. We want to introduce a new a tool that um, it will be useful later for uh, broadcast channels. So it turns out there's a lot of interplay between the uh, coding methods for source and channel coding, as you've already seen, right? You have this capacity problem, which is a maximization. If you looked at the rate distortion function, it involved a minimization of mutual information. And there are many close relations because this minimization is now over all channels, right? So here we fix the channel and are optimizing the source. Here we're fixing the source and we're optimizing over the channel under the constraint that the distortion function is, uh, that the distortion, average distortion is satisfied. So there's a very close duality here. So it turns out the coding methods you use are very closely related and they will be here too. And you'll see that there's sort of duals of each other. Okay, so let's start with the first source coding problem that has a network uh, flavor to it. And that will very quickly lead us to an open, pro you know, open problems that are uh, fascinating. Very few people work on these open problems because most people think they're too hard, and so if they give up even before starting, right? <laughs> but again, so there's always a risk, you know, like if you're looking at basic problems, there's always a risk you're going to get nothing, obviously, right? So that'll be very disappointing. On the other hand, the reward is gigantic. So this is, these are examples of high risk, you know, high reward problems. Uh, fundamental problems are, some, are usually very high risk. <laughs> Because again, you might wind up with nothing. So, and that can be uh, very disappointing. Uh, on the other hand, if you do find something um, new, fundamentally, you'll get a lot of attention. OK, so let's talk about the first thing called distributed source coding. Source coding. Um, sometimes this gets the name, um, um, I like to sometimes just call it the Slepian Wolf problem. Um, the motivation for saying it that way is that there's a clear paper that first developed the theory for this problem and, and also really looked at it, and that was uh, David Slepian and Jack Wolf. Um, both Jack Wolf died in 2011, I think, so not so long ago. He's relatively young still. I think he was 74 or something like that, or maybe younger even. David Slepian uh, passed away around maybe 10 years ago now. I was fortunate enough to have met both. Um, uh, David Slepian was many, many years at Bell Labs, uh, also department head there, and Jack Wolf moved around, right? So he started in New York. He was born in Newark, <laughs> New Jersey, uh, then worked in New York, worked in uh, Massachusetts, and went to UCSD. 
um, where he spent the rest of his career. Wonderful people, wonderful people. Um, so let's look at what the model is, the problem. So the model here is going to be a slight extension of the source coding problem and the main difference is we're going to have two rather than one sequences. So we're going to have a source, we're going to model the source by a joint distribution. So think, think of this, you know, microphone problem, you know, there's one, um, something being measured there, something being measured there and there's a correlation between the two. Now here we're simplifying the correlation to have no memory. Of course, that's not realistic, but the reason we discuss, we want to focus on these um, non-realistic models is because it turns out the theory is really interesting, and it turns out that theory is exactly what you need for sources with memory. It's, it's a one-to-one, -one, the same thing with minor, you know, variations. There isn't much more you get out of the whole thing by going to sources of memory other than applications. And of course, applications are important, right? So you want to look at that. But the basic theory is what we need. So there's two sequences being produced and here we'll have two and this is the important part of the problem distributed encoders. That's what's different than before encoder one encoder two and the model is that we take this um, sequence of samples let's say suppose it was a band limited signal like waveform then we can sample it at the Nyquist rate so we can convert it a signal to a sequence of real numbers or a sequence of complex numbers and the encoder takes that sequence and maps it into a certain number of bits and we'll measure that number of bits as um, we'll, we'll write it as n times so we have some relation to the number of samples we have times the rate so R1 bits, right? So the number of bits is number of samples we have times some rate, R1. And of course later we'll want to scale um, and make n big bits. So both encoders operate in distributed fashion. The, the decoder, however, sees both. So you can think of both sensors having wires to a central terminal and that central terminal's job is then to reproduce the two input sequences. Okay, so that's the distributed source coding problem. Well, the problem, let's write it out. So the problem, find the set of rate pairs, R1, R2. So these two numbers here, those are our parameters. But really what we find, want to find is not the rate pairs, but these three boxes, the encoder one, encoder two, and the decoder, that's what we're interested in, for which there are, are, but in the process of finding what these are, we need to find the encoders, so, but what we're really after is these boxes, not so much the rates, right? And this, this comes, um, uh, well, let me complete this first, where's the encoders for which? Uh, for which there are encoders, uh, uh, um, so that for sufficiently large n, so here comes the scaling, we're allowing large delay, uh, we have the error probability as small as we, you know, probability is going to be the probability that x, the pair x hat n y hat n is not equal to the input sequences is as small as desired. And in brackets, uh, but could be positive is okay. Okay, so we want it to be as small as possible, but not, we don't force it to be exactly zero, right? So that's, that's just an important. Thing. We don't want, we're not looking for like a zero error probability results here. We, we, we're, we're fine if it's 10 to the minus 100 because, uh, you know, 10 to the minus 100 we'll never see in our lifetime, so why do we care, right? So that's the main reason. And it turns out that by doing that we make our life a lot easier. So as engineers we want to make life easy, and so that's why we do that. Okay, um, right, so let's take a look at some 
what we think we can do just before the break. Uh, right, so what we're looking for is a region because we're looking for pairs. Well, what's something we can clearly do, right? What, what have we learned? I mean, how, with how many rates can I represent the sequence perfectly, right? So the simplest approach is just to have both compressing down to entropy, right? Because we know from the source coding, we can represent any sequence of symbols by their entropy, right? So that certainly we can, you know, we can compress the first source down to h of x and we can operate you know at that rate right and similarly the other one can do the same thing right the second one could compress to h of y right so we can clearly operate at this point here right clearly up and if we can operate at this point here we can always waste bits why not well so we can operate anywhere in here right that's definitely achievable simply by using lossless data compression so even if the source had memory, we might use, you know, lempels of coding here, lempels of coding here, and we can achieve that point. Uh, now the next question is, can we do better, right? And that's what we're going to really be after here. Um, to talk about that just before the break, um, let's try to develop a simple and obvious bound on what can be accomplished. The uh, simplest approach is to say, well, let's let the encoders cooperate. Suppose they both see both messages. To what rate could we compress now? There, we also know the answer, right? It's just a data compression problem. It's just going to be the joint entropy, right? So R1 plus R2, we certainly have. You know, so let's keep those two things in mind. The rate pair R1, R2 equals H of X, H of Y. Uh, is, uh, I guess I should talk about, um, uh, uh, well, the, the, I, should, I guess I should talk something about a capacity region or something like that. So the source coding region for this problem is just the closure of this set of pairs, but anyway, is uh, feasible. Let me just call it, use that terminology, even though I haven't defined it pro properly. And uh, we also have very easily by a cooperative bound that R1 plus R2 has got to be bigger than the joint entropy, right? Because this is sort of a, this is just a cooperative bound. So if we plot that, well, the joint entropy is always bigger than these two, right? So it might be here, H of X, Y. And then I have to draw a diagonal line up. Maybe, I don't know if I went too far here, but let's say h of x, y. Anyway, we know we have to lie above that curve. Okay, that we know. So, the, okay, this plot wasn't quite as nice as I wanted to make it. I could have made the gaps a little bigger. What we want to show is what we'll find is we can actually operate on that curve. Even, so we can operate on this, on this line even though the two nodes are distributed. They're not cooperating. So we can get the same rates as a fully cooperative encoder with the right smart way of encoding. Okay, and that's what we want to get at. So it'll turn out that this is the region that we can actually achieve. Right there, where this is the joint entropy. And since the joint entropy, of course, this point here has to be the sum of these. That plus that has to give me the joint entropy. And of course, that would then just be h of x given y. We'll see this. And similarly, this one will have to be h of y given x. Okay, so what we'll find is that encoding just separately is strictly suboptimal. And what's really surprising, I think, is you get a nice simple answer. The form of the region we'll get is looks simple. And what's remarkable is we can get the same, we can achieve rate pairs that operate at the same rates as if the encoder coders were cooperating even though they cannot, right? So that will be our goal in the um, next hour is to develop the uh, coding techniques and getting a little bit of an idea of how to do the proof to of uh, this method. We can talk a little bit about um, implementation too, um, but let's leave that for the break. So.